Ladies, gentlemen, distinguished guests and colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the university this evening to celebrate the work of one of our most accomplished academics, Professor Derek Carson, who holds the university chair in applied cognitive psychology and leads the division of psychology here at Abite. I would also like to extend a welcome to members of Professor Carson's family who are here with us this evening, his parents, Robert and Mary, his wife, Paula, his brothers, Craig and David, sister, Elizabeth, and two children, Alex and Katerina, with happy birthday to daughter, Katerina. You are all most welcome to Abate, and I did wonder what price Katerina had extracted from her father for attending this evening. In many ways, the progress of Professor Carson's career to date reflects his single-mindedness and commitment to the life of an academic, with, in his case, very little hesitation, interruption, or indeed repetition. He started his career as a research assistant and moved smoothly and swiftly through the ranks of academe. Although Derek admits to finding his discipline psychology only after attending university rather than as a planned subject of study, thereby demonstrating one of the primary functions of a university, which is to stimulate curiosity and to develop the mind. Today, universities are also being urged to ensure that their teaching and research is highly relevant to society. Abite is proud of its achievements in aligning its interests with those of a wider public. And Professor Carson's work with the Scottish Institute of Policing is a shining example to all of us in how to have public policy impact combined with high quality research. So from where did such an excellent scholar emerge? Derek originally trained at the universities of West of Scotland, Nottingham and Stirling, completing his PhD in 1997. As a leader, Derek has headed the psychology division with distinction for four years, and on behalf of both Senate and his close colleagues, I'd like to express a very warm thank you to him for his significant contribution to the life of the university. As a researcher, Professor Carson has set an impressive pace with over 30 research papers, re refereed articles so far in his career, and many other conference presentations. He is a reviewer for several prestigious journals, including the British Journal of Psychology and the Quarterly Journal of Experimental Psychology. Therefore, this evening, it is right for me to claim that we're about to hear from an acclaimed expert in his field. And I now invite Professor Carson to deliver his inaugural lecture entitled The Appliance of Psychological Science. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming along this evening. Uh, it's rather wonderful to see uh, so many faces that I, I recognise, uh, but equally pleasing to see faces that I don't recognise. So thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I am aware that there's a football tournament on this evening and there's a rather interesting game on around about 7 o'clock, so uh, I, I won't delay you uh, too much. If you don't mind, I'd like to start with a, a little anecdote uh, not because uh, I think it's funny, but I, I do think it, it was quite, uh, it tickled me at the time. But uh, I, I think it a, has a message which is pertinent for the, the talk that I want to give this evening. And the anecdote is just a brief description of an event that happened uh, in, in my own home uh, quite recently. And it's uh, a truthful event, and I, I don't exaggerate it in any way, shape or form. And indeed, my wife was there, so she can act for its uh, uh, veracity when, 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 uh, when I describe it. Paul and I wanted to have some work. We wanted to make some renovations to our home. Uh, and those people who know me, what I mean by that is I want to get a man in to do some renovations to the home. DIY is not one of my forties. And uh, as luck would have it, we, we wanted to have some decorating done. And as what luck would have it, our neighbours were having some decorating done at the same time. So we asked our neighbours to uh, ask the painter and decorator to come at the end of the day to come in, have a look at the job and see if he wanted to, uh, to do it. So five o'clock came, he duly came along, uh, the doorbell rang, I went to the door, I, I greeted him, welcomed him to my home, 
Uh, took him through to the living room, which is where we wanted the work done. And as most tradesmen do, he came in, he started looking at the walls, looking at the ceiling, and so on, started umming and eyeing. And then he took me aback, because I was expecting a question along the lines of, what colour do you want it? Or do you want it painted or papered? But his first question, and bear in mind, I've never met this man before. His first question was, what do you do? I thought, OK, um, I'm an academic. I work in universities. And his reply was, oh, my God. <laughs> his next question, uh, and uh, <laughs> um, I, I should have known not to answer it honestly. His next question was, well, what do you teach at this university of yours? And I should, have, I should have made up something that I think he would have thought was appropriate. But I, I said, I'm a psychologist. And it went downhill. So from, from saying, oh, my God, he, then st he really started shaking his head and saying, do you know what? That's what's wrong with the world. <laughs> what a waste of time. What a waste of money. What a waste of effort. And now, it's why society is in the state it's in. All our taxpayers' money going to pay stupid jobs. And this debate went on for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, well, I call it a debate. I'm sure he called it an argument. An argument I, I think I won because eventually I, I did lose the rag with him a little bit because no matter what I said, he just would not take it. He, he wouldn't be persuaded that now universities do anything good. Uh, and when I had to point out to him, I said, well, you're about over 65. He said, yes. Yeah. So I said, well, I would imagine that you want cash in hand for this job and the tax man doesn't need to know about it. He said, yeah. I said, that's what's wrong with society. <laughs> it's people avoiding their taxes. But anyway, the, re the reason why I'm starting off with this little uh, uh, anecdote is that I actually, it might surprise you, but I think he had a point. Now, I don't agree with him. I, don't think you know, I certainly don't think that universities have absolutely nothing to offer society. Far from it, I think universities massively contribute to the society that we live in. I don't agree with him because, I mean, he, he, he had a particular problem with psychology. As far as he was aware, psychology was just a load of nonsense. He'd seen psychologists on television, he'd watched Big Brother, now he'd listened to them, and it was either a load of baloney or it was just common sense. And I certainly don't, uh, didn't agree with him that I was personally respond, responsible for society's problems. But what, what I do, or what, what I, I think the point that he had is that he didn't know what universities were about. He didn't know what psychology was. And I actually think what he was just voicing was now a belief that many people in society have of universities. Not all, thankfully, but I think many do question the utility of um, universities and what universities do. And what I hope to do today is to introduce you to a number of areas that might be surprising to you, uh, a number of areas of research that psychologists have actually, uh, research that's conducted both here in the University of Alberta, but also as I look out, um, I am going to mention some of the work that uh, some of my really good colleagues and friends have conducted over the years that I think are very good examples of psychologists bringing something to the table and something that does help us um, improve the society in which we live in. Now, it's not just that chap and people like that chap who need to be persuaded of the utility of the research conducted in universities. Um, as, I mean, the people who fund our research more and more uh, are starting to ask universities to really look at what we do and really make the case for us being allowed to continue to do that type of research. One only needs to look at the, the funders of research. Most of the funding of research uh, in the UK falls or is paid for by one of these four categories. The government through the, um, the, the research councils. Okay, the seven main research councils in the UK give a tremendous amount of money to universities and other research institutions to carry out leading edge research that hopefully will have some impact. And I'll be talking about impact quite a lot this evening. Of course, charities also um, fund a lot of re research in the UK. Uh, quite often, or it's almost always the case, that they, they fund research in particular areas that's important to that particular, uh, that particular charity, like the um, like Macmillan Cancer Research and so on. Industry, again, spends a huge amount of money in research. I mean, obviously, uh, many industry partners have their own R&D departments and they do a lot of their research in-house. But more and more, um, industry is looking to universities to make use of the, expert, uh, the expertise that actually lies in universities and so on. 
And of course, there are individual benefactors who, who pay for research. But what they all have in common is that this huge amount of money, and it's actually difficult to estimate how much money is spent in research, but looking through the Research Council's UK's website uh, just earlier on today, um, they make the claim that they alone spend three billions of pounds every year funding research of a massive variety in, in the UK. And what they want is some sort of return on this investment. Now, to, to use a colloquial phrase, they want a bang for their buck. They want to be persuaded that what we do really does make a difference to society. And what I hopefully am going to do today is demonstrate that that's the case. Now, just to demonstrate my point, uh, again, I just looked through uh, a few of the, uh, the Research Council's websites today, and you don't need to look far. Indeed, you only need to look at their, their, their front pages, their home pages, to see that this really is the, uh, it's a single message that's coming out from all of the funding councils. So here we have Research Councils UK, and on the front page, they've got the, uh, the banner, Excellence with Impact. The ESRC, the funders of a lot of social science research and psychology research in the UK. Um, again, on the front page, we have one of their major tabs, Impacts and Findings. And I'm not going through them all, but the last one, the Medical Research Council. Uh, again, on the front page, Achievements and Impact. So they really are looking for evidence that what we do is useful. Now, those of us who are academics are very much focused on looking at the research that we do and trying to uh, demonstrate that, we, uh, that this impact is there. And one of the main ways that we'll have to do this is, not everyone will, will realise this, but, but every six years, the, the government and the, uh, the research councils uh, conduct a, a large audit of the research that's conducted in all universities in the UK, or all research institutions higher uh, education institutions in the, in the UK. And they do this about every six years. And for the first time uh, in 2014, one of the elements that's going to contribute to uh, a submission's actual score is the impact. Okay, so about 65% of the final score is going to be based on the perceived quality of the papers that we as academics write. Uh, and that's going to be judged through uh, peer review. Uh, about 15% of the overall score is going to be based on the environment that our universities have created for us to conduct world-class leading research. Uh, but 20%, uh, a rather substantial chunk, is given over to this perceived impact. Okay. And we have been warned, I don't know if warns are the right word, but we've been notified that it might be 20% this time round, but the next time that we're going to have one of these uh, audits of, the, of UK research, then it's going to be even higher, 25, perhaps 30%. So the funding bodies, everyone, the government's telling us, demonstrate that what you do, if you want us to continue to fund your research, demonstrate that it is useful. Now, of course, there's... Uh, I thought at this point I might try and define what research is, uh, but I got myself all tangled up. So really, all I'm going to draw here is the distinction between two major uh, types of research. And traditionally, research has been separated into this dichotomy of basic or pure research or applied research. And if I take the basic pure research first of all, it's typified by a very methodical approach to trying to get to a really detailed understanding of the thing or the behaviour that you're interested in, in, in studying. And it's typified by uh, most academics in the UK spend three or four years conducting a, uh, a PhD, really getting to grips with a, a, a small specific area. And at the end of that three year period, hopefully you become an expert in it. And most academics actually go on and research after the PhD, continue to research in a very, very similar area. Might branch out a little bit, but most um, academics tend to stick to what they know. Well, that was, that was traditionally the case. And what you tend to do is that you have, an, you collect data, you, have an under, or you, you, you think you have an understanding of the phenomenon that you're, that you're studying, and you might come up with a theory or a model that tries to explain that phenomenon. And then if you have that model, then if it's a good model, that model will make predictions. So you go and you think, ah, there's a prediction, I'll go and test it. If the data from that test um, is support, supports your hypothesis, then that's great, you've tweaked your model a little bit. 
if it, uh, the data doesn't support your, your, your model or your theory, then your modeler theory must be wrong in some way and we have to think about changing it. And that, that's the way in which we accumulate uh, uh, detailed understanding of the thing that we're interested in. One of the criticisms of this basic or pure research, and, and as I say, this is the type of research that traditionally was done uh, in UK universities or universities all throughout the world. And one of the main criticisms, though, is that it can take a long time for any real, any real, real world impact to be accrued because the academic has sort of like taken themselves away. They've locked themselves in the laboratory and so on, and they're collecting the data. They, they, they are expert in the field, but does that knowledge actually get out there to make a, a difference in the real world? Applied research, on the other side, is a, a different approach to conducting research. It tends to be very focused on a specific problem. And that problem might originate out there in the... I, 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 I do hesitate to say the real world, because universities are part of the real world, but in, uni but in the world outside uh, universities. Uh, and because it tends to be a very specific problem, and then you, you design your study or whatever, or your, your research programme to try and understand that problem or solve that problem or understand the issue a little bit better, then there's much more of a possibility, much more likelihood of a very immediate impact, much more so than the basic research. This was always the dichotomy and the argument that, that separated these, these two different types of research. But the main criticism, or the traditional criticism of applied research, is that it normally led to, because it was looking at a very specific problem, it tends to lead to small incremental changes to our knowledge state. We don't really have that massive eureka moment that can be applied out with the specific problem that we're, that we're working on. Okay, so this is the, the traditional dichotomy that's in there. I personally think it's a little bit... Um, I, I, don't, I don't think this dichotomy works. I, I think there's, there's more... Uh, these, two types, these two types of research actually have more in common than people uh, believed. More recently, um, there's been a move to, well, it's, it's an alternative to having this separation between basic research and applied research. And it's referred to as transla translational research. And it's, it's a, 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 a movement, I suppose, that's coming out mainly out of the uh, medical research area. And it's designed to try and get the findings from the basic research. Because remember, if we buy into the argument before, the basic research is where we really get a very, very detailed and good understanding of the phenomenon that we're actually studying. Now, surely that must be a good, th surely that must be a good thing, uh, collecting this level of knowledge. But what the translational research is saying is, let's try and take that very quickly and put it out there so that it can make a difference. In order to allow that to happen, then this separation between researchers and people who are not researchers and not academics and so on, then that, those barriers, those boundaries, are, are, uh, there's an attempt to break them down, where practitioners and researchers work together. Okay? They might work together right at the very beginning when you're trying to establish what your research question is, the design for your, your, your study and so on. Again, trying to accelerate the... Uh, the, the impact that might come out, uh, or the good that might come out of this research, then it's quite often um, there's this multidisciplinary approach. So if we say psychologists have a particular um, skill set, then it's not the be-all and end-all, because an engineer might also have, uh, well, they, they might have a skill set which is slightly different. And if you put these two things together, perhaps they'll complement one another a little bit more, and perhaps that will help us go from taking the findings that we have from our basic research and be able to apply that uh, in a much more uh, quickly, uh, to, to do it much more quickly. But to me, the reason why I quite like this, this notion of translational research, and, it, and if I'm being honest, I actually only came across the, the term very, very recently when someone came for a job interview and started talking about it. So this was my understanding of what was going on, but I didn't know what the actual term was. Um, but what I like about it is that I actually think that applied research really has got something going for it. But I don't think all applied research is good. I think the applied research that's most likely to lead to real good quality impact is the applied research that actually makes use of the findings from the basic or pure research. Okay? Because that's what we have, the, um, the argument is that's what we have the, the best um, level of knowledge about the thing that we're interested in studying. So, 
What I'm going to do in today's uh, talk um, is hopefully introduce you to four case studies that I think are very, or I believe are very good examples of this type of translational research. Research which is having a real impact out in the world outside universities, but research which is fundamentally, or it draws fundamentally on uh, a very good understanding of the phenomenon that we're interested in. And it's going to be from the, my, my own area, the area of psychology. Now, I shouldn't make the assumption that everybody knows what psychology is. Uh, I wish everyone did, but not, not everyone does do. So let me take just 60 seconds or so to give you my take on what it is. It's actually quite difficult to define. And again, if you go to a whole number of websites like I've done recently and a whole number of textbooks, then if you had 10, I've established if you had 10 psychologists in a room, ask them for a definition of psychology, you'll probably come up with 11 different definitions. So the one that I, I quite like here is actually the one which is taken from uh, our professional body of psychology in, in the UK, the, the British Psychological Society. And they define psychology as the scientific study of people, the mind, and behavior. Okay, it's really trying to understand what makes us human and so on. What, um, can we predict human behaviour? Can we understand human behaviour? Can we understand human thought? Can we understand what's going on up here when I'm speaking to you and you're listening to me and so on? The problem with psychology, and I think this is one of the reasons as to why not everyone has a good handle on what psychology is, is that it's a, a huge discipline. It's a very, very broad church. And I've just listed some of the, the main disciplines within the, the larger discipline of psychology. So there are people who uh, research in the area of biological psychology, looking at our, the physiology of our body and how that influences our behaviour. Personality and individual differences. By individual differences, one of the main areas there is, the, uh, is trying to get a handle on what is intelligence and so on. Social psychology, how does our behaviour uh, do we adapt our behaviour because we live in social groups and so on? Uh, developmental psychology. And then, of course, there's a... I mean, this list is by no means exhaustive. And I've just noted a few of the professional areas of psychology, like clinical psychology, occupational psychology, forensic psychology, and so on. It really is a broad church. But the area that I'm going to speak about is the area that I've been trained in, the area of psychology that really interests me. Um, and it's the area of cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology is the study of mental processes involved when we interact with our environment. So effectively, what we're trying to understand is what goes on up here when we do just about all the tasks that a human being can do. So the mental process is involved when we perceive things, when we learn, when we think, when we use language, and when we understand. And the problem with, um, with psychology, and I think this is one of the reasons why people think psychology is all just like common sense, is that we're not actually aware of the massive amount of processing that's going on up here when we do everyday tasks. When I'm speaking to you, uh, I don't have to think, right, what's the next word coming out and so on and plan that next word and so on. It just seems to happen. When you're listening to me and so on, you don't have to really concentrate on what I'm saying on every single word. Hopefully, you're getting the gist of, of, of what I'm saying and so on. Sometimes you may not, but hopefully you're getting the, uh, the main idea of what I'm speak speaking about. So we're not aware of the processing that's going on up, up, up in here in our brains, but there's a huge amount going on. And sometimes we only really become aware of it when things start to go wrong. So, for example, one of the areas that uh, I've uh, conducted some research in is the area of face recognition. We take it really for granted, our ability to look down here and recognise that that's my son Alex and my, my daughter Katerina. It seems to me effortless and so on. But in order for me to do that, there's lots of processing going on. And unfortunately, it can go wrong. And people who have certain types of brain trauma and so on sometimes have a very specific problem after they've had the traumatic experience and they no longer can recognise faces. It's called people who have prosopagnosia and so on. And it's when we start to look at these things that we take for granted when they start to go wrong that we think, oh, maybe there's more to it and so on. So, cognitive psychology. And the, the, the examples, these case studies that I am going to go on to, these case studies that I'm going to describe to you are from this general area of cognitive psychology. So, the first one. I said to you before, one of the areas that uh, I've worked in in the past is the area of uh, face recognition. And the, the area of face recognition is an area which is absolutely, it's, it's easy to apply it to, to uh, the world outside university research. Because if you're a witness to a crime and 
Uh, or indeed, in the, the case of this cat here, it's not a witness, it looks as though it's been the, uh, the victim of a crime and so on. You might be going to a police station and you might uh, be, be asked by an investigating officer to describe your assailant. And, uh, and it's actually very, very difficult to do that. And these days, if you do go into a police station in this type of scenario, it's very unlikely that you'll sit down with a police sketch artist. What's more likely to happen is that you'll sit down, you'll provide a verbal description of the face, the, the officer will, or will use that information and will actually take your description and put it into a database. And that database is a database of lots and lots and lots of different features from the face. Lots and lots of examples of eyes, lots and lots of examples of noses, mouths and so on. And the assumption is that your description will match up, generally match up with some of the, uh, the, the exemplars of uh, facial features in this uh, piece of software and it will generate a face like this. So th these are facial composites or you might know them as EFITs. It, those of you who watch Crime Watch see these types of things all the time. And the idea is, is that you come up with this representation of a face and use the, the witness like say, well, yeah, there's something I like, I like about that, but the hair's completely wrong, so you change the hair. Okay, so here we have two identical faces. The only thing that's different are two identical facial composites. The only thing that's different between these two uh, stimuli is the, it, it's, it's different here. And so that's what you would do in this system. You would sit, you would work on the eyes, you would change the eyes till you got a set of eyes that you liked. You'd work in the nose, then you'd work in the mouth. And the whole idea is that the face is no more than the sum of its parts. Okay, so if you can come up with a, an acceptable set of eyes, an acceptable nose, an acceptable mouth, put them all together, you'll come up with a, an acceptable representation of the person that you're trying to describe. Nonsense. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way at all. An alternative system developed by uh, two colleagues that I, I've worked with uh, uh, for many, many a year now, uh, Peter Hancock and Charlie Froud, who were at the University of Stirling when this system was being developed. Charlie, who's sitting in the audience, hello Charlie, um, is now at the University of Central Lancashire, have come up with a, a completely alternative way of addressing this problem. And their system is called EvoFit. And whereas in the last system, what you do is you look at the, the, the individual features, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. In this system, we don't do that at all. If I was a witness, uh, to, and, and I was being interviewed by the, uh, the police officer, I would look at an array of faces like this, and would say, do you know what? There's something about that face, that face, and that face that I like. I don't need to say what it is I like about it. Now, I'm not interested in the features. There's just something about that face that I like. And what the system then does is that it takes the information from that face, that face, and that face, and it evolves them together, and it generates a whole new array of faces. And then I do it again. Okay, so I'll have a second set of faces up here. I'll say, yeah, I like that one, that one, and that one this time. And the process will be done again. So it's completely different. The first time round, you're looking at, you're making judgment about individual features. The second time round, you're making judgment about a holistic face. Now, the question that arises here is, why do we have this alternative system? Okay. Surely the first one, now, lots of uh, information, sorry, lots of money was spent on developing it. It was actually developed up at the University of Aberdeen by the psychology department in the late 70s and early 80s. And it seemed to do a job. So why do we need to have this second one here? The reason why we have this second one is because people like Peter and Charlie paid attention to the research, the basic research from face recognition. And they established that this is the way to go, not the, the alternative way. So I'm going to try and persuade you of that, because one of the major failings of the original system, this feature-based system, is that it forces us to process faces feature by feature, to work on the eyes, work on the nose, work on the mouth. But actually, that's not how we process faces. Okay, when I look at um, Alex's face and so on, I don't process his eyes, then his nose, his mouth. I have a more holistic approach to face recognition. Uh, every part of his face affects every other part of his face. And I'm going to try and persuade you of that. So this is where the interactive part of the, uh, of the audience works. So I'm going to show you some facial stimuli. And I'd just like you to shout out who you think it is. Okay, I'm going to make it slightly hard. I'm only going to show you half a face. Does anyone recognise this celebrity? Anyone at all? Gary Lineker, thank you. There's always at least one person that gets it, so thank you. <laughs> okay, so Gary Lineker, what about the bottom half of the face? Is that any harder? Paul Gascoigne. Paul Gascoigne, yeah. It, it works with people who are not footballers. Okay, now, a psychologist, Andy Young, in around about 1986, 
conducted a very similar experiment to this. And what he just demonstrated is that there's sufficient information in half a face for us to recognise that face if it's well enough known to us. So he did a very similar thing in a laboratory and found out that his participants could name these faces quite easily. Until he did this. And he just put the two halves together. And the, the question, the task for his participants was the same thing. Who's on top and who's on the bottom? And what he found is that his participants found it really difficult to do this. Because when we look at faces, we look at them holistically. So even though we were being asked to only look at the top of the face, the bottom half was affecting our perception of the top half and vice versa. Okay? When he disrupted that configural processing by just simply doing that, misaligning them just a little bit, then performance went back up as to the same level or similar levels as he was only showing the top half or the bottom half. So I think quite good evidence that we use this holistic approach to face recognition. One last one. If we turn things upside down, we no longer rely on configural processing. We actually revert to featural processing. That's the argument in the book. So we also, if you turn things upside down, they're harder to recognise. Not impossible. Do you recognise this chap? Yeah, Robbie Williams. Thanks, Malachi. Um, it, is, it is Robbie Williams. You see anything strange about Robbie Williams? He's a really nice-looking chap. So millions of records on the fact that he's got a nice-looking face and a nice voice. You know, there's something not quite right about his eyes, something not quite right about his mouth, but it's difficult to put your finger on it. What I'm now going to do is just revert this picture and show you upright. And straight away you can see what we had done to it. Okay? I wonder how many discs they would have sold if they actually looked like this. So what we've actually done here is that we've just taken his eyes, we've turned them upside down, taken his mouth and we've turned that upside down. And that's exactly the same picture here. When we use configural processing, we can see that there's something wrong straight away. But when we're using feature, uh, feature by feature processing, we're much more likely to accept that that's a, a plausible face. Okay? So if you put these two things together, what we're demonstrating is that Charlie and Peter's system of requiring people to make holistic judgments about faces is much more likely, well, it's, it's more akin to what we normally do, and therefore their system should be better than the, the previous system, which was using this feature one. So it was learning from basic research of face recognition to improve our performance. So here, here's just a little bit of uh, fun. Um, a, a good number of years ago, uh, Charlie uh, and I got together to try and uh, conduct a test, his system against the, the, the EFIT system, see which one was best once and for all. And all, all I've got, I'm not going to go into the, the, the details of the findings, but all I'm going to show you is some of the stimuli that came out of that. So can you recognise this EFIT of a famous person? Now remember, it's not a photograph, it's just a likeness. Michael? Yep, Michael Owen. Well done. <laughs> this one here. It's a little bit harder. It's Rodney from Only Fools and Horses. Okay. So remember, they, these are not Nic Nicholas Linders. These are not photographs. It's just likenesses. And it shows you the difficulty of actually trying to recreate one of these things in, in, now, uh, if you are a witness to a crime. What about th this? is um, a more recent one from one of Charlie's. Uh, Simon Cowell. Okay. So, impact. What impact has this new system had out there in the real world? Well, I suppose one of the, the best tests of these types of systems is that if they're actually being used, and I'm sure Charlie is really pleased to, uh, to, for me to acknowledge that this system now is being used by many, many police forces in, in the UK, uh, mainly being used in uh, English police forces, but I believe Glasgow have just recently asked you to get involved in a, in a case. So he, here's just very, very quickly a, a real life case. Uh, unfortunately, a, a young girl was a, a sexually assaulted in a, in a park and she went to the police station uh, she conducted an interview with the police officers and they created a, an, an evil fit. Uh, that evil fit was then taken down to the park, a name was given, and this chap here's name came up and he, he later confessed to the crime. Another one, uh, down, again down in England there was a, a serial rapist and his second victim uh, went into the police station, was able to give a, a, a good description of the um, of the of her assailant, and that evil fit was then uh, advertised in the local area, and a number of people came up with the same name and named this chap, and then DNA took over, and he was uh, 
convicted, I believe, uh, of, of the crime. So, a second case study. Okay, so that, that was the first uh, case study there was an example of research, applied, an applied problem, ch changing the way it thought about this, this applied problem by making reference to basic research, and then uh, together there was a, a good evidence of impact actually happening. Another case study that comes here uh, from uh, some of my colleagues, uh, or one of my colleagues here in Aberté, uh, Dr Fiona Garbert, um, has, again, is working very, very closely with the police officers. And one of the biggest problems with any eyewitness account is the delay between when an event actually happens and when the eyewitness is actually interviewed. The longer the delay, the less likely we are to have um, a, a good memory of that event. Details are lost very, very quickly indeed. So if police officers can do one thing uh, to improve the, uh, the amount of information they can get from eyewitnesses, it's just interview the witnesses as soon as they possibly can. Now that becomes a resourcing issue because say, for example, you have um, an event where there are lots of witnesses to the event. It could be a road traffic accident and there's 20 witnesses to that road traffic accident. Now the police turn up and they cannot interview everyone at the same time. So what Fiona has developed is a test that allows people to administer an interview to themselves, and then, well, you, you'll see what happens in a second. So what we have here is a picture of a witness completing a form, and the form that this person is completing is referred to as the, the self-administered interview. Okay, it's a, a, a tool that Fiona and her colleagues uh, have developed. Now, the underlying research, when, when Fiona and her colleagues were putting this together, the underlying research that they made reference to is just the research and the basic research on human memory. Human memory, uh, in order for it to work, uh, most cognitive psychologists believe that there's three main stages to, to memory. Encoding, storage and retrieval. And in order for memory to work, all three of these stages need to work uh, independently and together. So, what we mean by encoding, now, you've got to pay attention. You've got to actually process uh, an event, first of all. If you don't process it, you can't later remember it. So we encode the information. We put down some sort of memory storage. And then we retrieve, we try later on, to try and retrieve information from that, uh, from that memory trace. Now, the problem is, when a police officer, police officer comes to interview a witness, they can't do anything about encoding. That's already passed. They can't do anything about the memory, uh, the, the storage part of the, the, the problem. That's already passed. But they can do a tremendous amount about retrieval. They can really pay attention to the way in which they interview witnesses. And a very famous um, psychologist uh, called Tulving uh, believes that encoding storage and retrieval are all important. But he actually thinks for this type of task, what's really important is what happens at encoding and what happens at retrieval. And he actually makes a statement that when we, when we take part in an event, when we try to remember something, then not only will we uh, process information about the thing it is that we want to later remember, we'll also process information about the context in which that information is presented. And the context is really important because when we come to try and retrieve the information, when we're being asked questions, now what happened and so on, then the best way of doing that is to use certain cues. And according to Tulving, if those cues can uh, sort of like embody a similar type of context, then our memory for the event will be better. So the, the degree of overlap between the context at encoding and the context at retrieval will affect the likelihood of recall. It's why, uh, it's one of the reasons as to why that witnesses are sometimes taken to the scene of the crime, because the context is the same. Okay, it's why uh, uh, Crime Watch sometimes run these reconstructions of crimes and so on. They're trying to trigger people's memory. So, the self-administered interview makes uh, use of this information. Okay? So what it is, it's a carefully designed uh, uh, tool regard, uh, telling witnesses what to expect when they're uh, being presented with this uh, form that they've got to fill in. There's plenty of guidelines and questions that provide retrieval support. Because remember, it's all about providing retrieval cues. And importantly, it helps the witness mentally reinstate the context. You can't always take the witness back to the scene of the crime. But there's evidence that if you try and recreate that in your mind's eye, then it's just as effective, or almost just as effective. So you won't be able to read this, so I've just scanned it in from Fiona's uh, 
um, front page of her self-administered interview. And I'll just read a little bit to, so you can get the gist of how they try to recreate the context. So think about the details of the incident, including the setting, what happened and who was involved. Think about what you were doing. Think about what was happening. Think about how you were feeling. Focus on everything that you could see. Concentrate on who you were with. Think about the other people who may have been near you. Concentrate on what was said. So you're just trying to recreate that context. Okay, does it work? Well, psychologists believe that the best way of interviewing a witness is to use a thing called a cognitive interview. And almost all police officers, as part of their, common uh, part of their normal training, are trained in using this co cognitive interview technique. It's a, an interview technique which makes use of knowledge about human, how psychologists think human memory works. It has a number of mnemonic techniques, little techniques that will improve memory and so on. So we're actually going to compare Fiona's self-administered interview against what we think is the best standard of interview that a police officer can conduct. And there's also going to be a, a second condition, which is just free recall, whereas, uh, and what happens here is that the witness views uh, a video of a crime and some witnesses then complete the self-administered interview. Some witnesses just are given a piece of paper and a pen and asked, write down what happened. And some witnesses actually undergo this full cognitive interview and so on. Okay. And importantly, they were immediately recalled. So they watch the video and then are asked to immediately recall the information. And what Fiona found in one of her experiments, uh, if you go along this axis here, the, the, longer, the, the further we go along the axis, the better the memory was. And the cognitive interview, remember the gold standard, is the one that you got slightly more information from. But the self-administered interview gave you just almost just as much information. In fact, the, these two conditions were not statistically significantly different from one another. So effectively, performance in these two tasks are the same. So Fiona's self-administered interview is almost as good as this cognitive interview. And the control condition, who are just simply writing their own uh, uh, free recall on a piece of paper, gave much, much less information. So that seems to suggest that the, this um, tool is working. The second question, though, because right at the beginning I was saying that the, the, the worst thing about, uh, or the thing that affects an eyewitness's memory most is having a delay. Well, does completing one of these uh, research, uh, sorry, does completing one of these self-administered interviews, does it actually protect witnesses against later forgetting the information? And the way that Fiona can uh, examine this was she got 16 members of the public, they watched the crime, immediately after the crime, one group completed this self-administered interview. One group completed a free recall. Again, just wrote something down on a piece of paper. And one group did nothing. They just provided their contact details. What's important is a week later, everybody was invited back in and everybody uh, participated in one of these cognitive interviews. They sit down interview with the police officer and then they looked at how much information was actually uh, given in these sit down interviews. And what they found, or what Fiona found, is that those people who had watched the video and then sat down and went through her form performed much, much better than anyone else. So this self-administered interview really does seem to work. So what impact is this tool having out there in the real world? Well, at the moment, and this number is going up almost on a weekly basis, at the moment uh, this, this tool has been field tested in 20 different police forces in the UK in six different countries in Europe, they, they are very, very interested in testing uh, this, this, this form for themselves. And it's currently used in three different countries. So th these are all the testing that's going on, the field testing out there outside universities. But it's actually been used in three different countries. And importantly, here in the UK, it's been tested in court. So the, the, the information that was contained in one of these reports went through all the checks and balances that the UK judicial system has and the judge accepted it into court and it led to, it helped contribute to um, the, the case against a particular individual. So again, really good examples of the impact outside of the university situation. The third case study um, is some work that um, I've conducted with a, um, a very good colleague, uh, someone that I'm really pleased to call my friend as well, uh, Professor Bill Lindsay and El Elaine Whitefield, who, who's sitting over here, who was her PhD student a number of years ago. And one of the areas, um, you may not know it, but uh, Dundee has, in Bill Lindsay, one of the, uh, the most influential 
clinical stroke forensic psychologist that actually works with sex offenders who happen to have a learning disability. Okay, so it's a very, very important job, and Bill is the, uh, the, the, the expert in the field in the UK in this area. And Bill and I worked together to develop a questionnaire um, capable of measuring what's referred to as cognitive distortions commonly expressed by sex offenders with a learning disability. Okay? Now, what we mean by cognitive distortions, well, th this is the actual questionnaire that we, that we developed together and, and I helped test. Cognitive distortions, there's been a lot of research in this field, all conducted all over the world, and there are many, many different theories as to why some people, unfortunately, sexually offend. And recently, most modern theories of sexual offending think that one of the important contributing factors is this thing called cognitive distortions. The fact that offenders will process information that's pertinent to their offence-related behaviour in a different way to people who don't sexually offend. Um, and th this, this, this different thoughts that they have about their behaviour and so on is just different from, or it allows them to legitimise their behaviour, allows them to justify, rationalise, and important, it allows them to, uh, in many cases, to minimise the impact of the offence on, on their actual victims. The QAXO is the, the tool that we developed. It's called, a, it's a little acronym. The question associated with uh, cognitions, uh, questions on attitudes consistent with sex offending. And there are seven different sections uh, that each look at a different type of sexual offence. Uh, so rape and attitudes to women, voyeurism, exhibitionism, dating abuse, homosexual assault, offences against children, stalking, sexual harassment. And this tool, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, very simple tool. It's just a set of statements that people are asked to say, I agree with that, I don't agree with that, or I don't know. So even though it's a very, very simple tool, what we've been able to establish is that sex offenders respond to this tool differently from people who don't offend. Okay, so we have, in a number of papers, we have demonstrated that this tool can discriminate between sex offenders. It can discriminate the responses from sex offenders from other types of offenders. Okay, so people who have offended in other ways that didn't involve um, inappropriate sexual behaviour. And it also discriminates from non-offenders as well. Within sex offenders, it can dis we can discriminate by looking at the responses that the, these people give to uh, the, the, this tool. It discriminates between those who... Um, abuse adults and those who abuse against children. Okay, so it's a very, very handy tool. And it's a tool that very quickly has had a huge amount of impact out in the real world. Um, the impact that it's had is that it's been used as part of a baseline assessment to identify the treatment need in clinical settings throughout the world. We're aware that the tool is used in just about every forensic um, service that has learning disability. Uh, a learning disability population. It's used in, uh, in the UK. It's used in just about every single um, service in the UK. We're aware of it being used in uh, similar settings in Australia, in Canada, uh, in America, and so on. It's, it's, it's very, very quickly um, been taken on by um, researchers, or sorry, by clinicians, uh, and so on. It's used as part of a repeat evaluation process to identify treatment gain. If you think this is one of the main contributing factors as to why people offend and your treatment programme doesn't affect the way in which people respond to this tool, then it gives you a handle on how well the treatment programme is actually going. As part of a risk assessment and management process, it's used uh, quite readily. And we think one of the main ways that it contributes to society is just by, by helping protect the public because it's a very, very important issue. Uh, and uh, this tool, we think, contributes in some way to that. Last case study, uh, and I seem to be on time. The last case study is a little bit different. It, it doesn't have a forensic um, element to it at all. Uh, the first three have. Um, this one, it's to improving the efficiency of self-service kiosks. Uh, and I'm really interested in this because there's something that I hate. If I go, if I go into a, a supermarket, well, I hate, I hate supermarkets. <laughs> My family are nodding here. But I absolutely hate queues. 
Okay, so sometimes you go into a supermarket, there's a huge queue, and you think, do you know what, I'll go to one of these, these new fancy things where you go and scan things yourself. And you get there, and then that's when it starts going downhill, because I'm hopeless at using them, you just get them wrong, because they're all, they're all different and so on. Now, psychologists, um, believe it or not, psychologists um, are helping uh, trying to design the next generation of these self-service kiosks, so people like myself and others don't get frustrated using them. Because the problem is, is that these kiosks contain a huge amount of information. And if you're not familiar with the, the, the kiosk that you're trying to use, then you're likely to just get it wrong. Now, press the wrong button, put your money in the wrong bit and so on, not be able to find your change. You can hear it dispensing, but just where is it being dispensed to and so on. Very, very frustrating. So, let's forget about kiosks for a second. I, I forgot about it. If I had delivered this lecture um, by constantly looking down in this corner. Okay, just now, just, I ignored you completely and just spoke the entire time looking down here. You might think one of three things. You might think, well, A, he's rude. B, he's socially inept. Or you might think, what's happening down in that corner? Okay, so my gaze direction can affect your attention. I, I can direct your attention by looking down here. Okay, and that's, it's the fact that we know this we think we can apply it to this situation to make using these kiosks a little bit better. Now, one of my very good friends, uh, Steve Langton, who, who's sitting in the office, has done a lot of work, not on kiosks, but has done a lot of work on this eye gaze uh, phenomenon. Uh, and I, I, I personally, Steve's a good looking bloke, isn't he? Now, I actually think the reason why Steve worked in this field is he just likes publishing papers where he can get his picture on it. <laughs> And you can also look to see how he's aged over the years. So this is how Steve looked at the year 2000, the year 2004, and he is aging well. But what Steve was doing here is he was, he was compiling some stimuli to look at the effect of eye gaze, to look at the effect of a participant looking at that face. Would it affect, would these eyes affect um, the participant's attention, where that person was, was attending to? So just looking at these two st stimuli here, do you think they're looking in the same direction? Most people think this is looking straight at them. Most people think this is looking slightly to the left and so on. Actually, the eyes are looking in exactly the same direction. The only thing that's changed here is the head direction. So this idea that we pick up on someone else's eye gaze is actually really complicated because it interacts with not only where the eyes are looking, but the head orientation and actually um, the, where the nose is pointing to as well. But the important thing to take here is that the eye when we look at someone's face, where they're looking at really does affect our cognitions and so on. So what researchers at Aberté, uh, Santiago uh, Martinez, who's a, a PhD student here in the university, and Ken Scott Brown, his supervisor from the psychology department, they're trying to make use of this phenomenon, uh, of, of this effect, to try and help us improve these, these kiosks. So he's taken the basic research that we've talked about here, We've made um, use of the skills of, not a psychologist, but of a, a computer artist here in the university where we have a, a, an abundance of uh, really, really talented computer artists. And what they've done is they've created an avatar, okay, a, a little kid on uh, face, that you can move the eyes, where the eyes are looking at. And they conducted an experiment where they took their avatar and then they had a number of, so you've got to think of a participant looking at this on the screen, and we're trying to influence the attention of the participant who's looking at the face. We're trying to make them look at one of these areas on the screen. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to do something with the eyes. So this is what Ken and Santiago did. So they came up with an experiment where the participant looks at the face, and the face either has a single picture looking up to the side, or a rather jerky movement of the head looking up, or we have much more motion of the head looking up in a much more naturalistic way. So, a static photograph, jerky moving over here, and smooth motion going across. And we're interested to see, does any of these, these three different stimuli, does it affect our atten the, the attention of the, per the person viewing the, the stimuli any more than the others. And the way they did it, we've got someone sitting here with their head in a, a sort of like a neck brace looking at a computer screen. And the reason for the, the neck brace 
is that we want to make use of a, a fancy piece of equipment that we have upstairs in the psychology department, which is an eye tracker. Okay, we can actually use a, a little mechanism that sits on some glasses and so on, and it has a camera looking out and a camera looking into you, your own uh, um, iris and so on. And we can actually determine where someone's looking at, and we can follow where they're looking. It's quite embarrassing sometimes when you're wearing these things, because you don't want people to know where you are looking sometimes. But we, we can actually record it. And what they did here is they recorded where people looked at when they were looking at these stimuli. Okay. And the question that they wanted to ask was, if this, actually seeing the head move with natural motion and the eyes looking to a particular area, would the participant be more, would, would they look across here quicker than if it was one of the other two conditions? And what they found was the following. Okay, so it's a reaction time experiment. This is the mean reaction time uh, that took someone to actually look at the point that we were trying to influence, or Santiago was trying to get them to be influenced to look at. And when it was a static face, just simply a, a face that just looked up there and there was only one frame, it took over two seconds to get the participant to look at that particular area. If there was the, the jerky motion, okay, just two frames, then they were faster. It was less than two seconds to move across. But if you had that smooth dy dynamic motion, then you massively influenced how quickly someone looked to that part of the screen. So what I want you to do here is just to use your imagination, because what, we're, what um, Santiago and Ken are trying to do is to get the, the people who make these self-service kiosks, and we actually have um, a, a company in, in, in Dundee NCR who, uh, who do make these things, we're trying to get them to actually have one of these avatars on the screen. So that rather than saying, put your money in the slot, and you think about which slot is it, and it goes like that. And so, like, oh, it's over there that I put my money, uh, and so on. And so the, whether this is actually going to have any real impact will, of course, be determined as to whether the manufacturers actually decide to take it on board. But we as psychologists think they should do, because it's actually quite cost effective. Because if they can get people to go through these scanners quickly, much more quickly, it will save money in the long run. So, just in conclusion, um, what I hope I've done today is to give you a few um, demonstrations, a few descriptions of the type of research that psychologists actually get involved in. And hopefully uh, I've maybe surprised some of you that psychologists are actually interested in this type of thing. Because uh, I think that a lot of people, when they think of psychologists, that just think of the one famous psychologist, Sigmund Freud, and isn't psychology something about dreams and uh, actually trying to interpret your dreams and so on? Now, the answer to that is, is no. Psychology is much, much more than that. Psychologists really do get involved in uh, research that I think really can have applications in the real world. We've only chosen four here. The applications, the, the research being conducted in uh, university psychology departments throughout the UK is... Uh, is very, very varied indeed. But the reason why I think these, um, the reason why I chose these examples is that I think they are good examples of this type of translational research. It is the case that it's an, they've all got an applied problem, they've all got psychologists working on this applied problem, but they all certainly draw on the basic research, the pure research that psychologists have slaved for years in our, in our laboratories to get a very good understanding of human cognition and then have applied it in, this, in these ways. Um, they certainly do involve collaborations. So uh, in the first one with the facial composites, then the, uh, the psychologists have worked with engineers, um, the psychologists have worked with the, the police in trying to improve these services and so on. And it's the fact that all three have come together I think, the fact that all three have come together, all three have made use of this basic research, that's why the impact is, is, uh, is being accrued. Likewise, with the self-administered interview, a very, very good collaboration between uh, police forces and psychologists. With the sex offender research, it's practitioners uh, that's working with research psychologists and psychiatrists. And in the self-service kiosks, then it's an example of psychologists working with animators, working with industry, and hopefully that impact will accrue from that particular example. And my final point is that psychological research is useful and does have real-world impact. And it's, a type, it's this type of research 
that our department here in the University of Aberdeen is getting a reputation for doing it. Uh, about four or five years ago, we took the, the decision to try and do more of this type of research, research that can be applied in the real world. It's what we are um, getting a reputation for, and it's the type of research that we will continue to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Carson. A really most interesting and enlightening talk. It's always a real pleasure to hear somebody who's a master of their subject, and it's, it's even more a pleasure to hear someone who's a master of their subject who can engage an audience and present information that may be new to people in, a, in an accessible fashion. So thank you very much for that. I think the, the, the thesis that Derek's presented, the, the notion of applied and translational research, is one that's particularly important here at Abate. Derek's made the point that that's the ambition of the psychology division to move into in further and further in that direction. But it reflects the ambition of the institution, an institution that aims to enhance the lives of the people in the community which it serves, both through its provision of programmes and academic courses, but also through the re research it, it delivers. So I think it's a really important message and one which I think was delivered with great um, plausibility. Thank you very much. <laughs>